wide angle lens films. She has had 30 years of experience in that. Just saying it again, 30 years. That's one decade more than what I am. Um, I think having somebody of that tenure itself is an honor. And uh, Sujata has had the opportunity to work with one of India's finest production companies and houses like Discovery, TV18, uh, NDTV and so on. And she has gone on to work and win multiple awards and entries across the globe. And uh, I think it's an honor to have you here again. And um, I think without any further ado, you can take us through. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anthony. And thanks uh, to the entire team for putting this all together and for having me here. It's a real honor to be here and, you know, to have an audience uh, like this. It's, uh, I have to say that I'm not used to being on this side of the camera like I was telling the team just now. I'm always used to being the other side and handing over a mic to somebody else. But uh, yeah, it's good to be here. I'm going to sort of take you through a little bit of my journey through some of my work and through some of the things that have changed my outlook and have sort of, you know, impacted uh, things in a wider way. I've been making films ever since I finished from NID, which was in 1985. And uh, I set up my own company very early, although I did work a couple of years with other um, film production setups and channels. Uh, I used to do graphics for NDTV for World This Week many years ago when uh, the program was at its uh, early stages. And, uh, but set up uh, wide angle films very early, I think somewhere in 1988, I set up uh, this thing. So I've got a lot of production experience behind me and uh, like I was telling Shweta Shri a little earlier, uh, it was a very male dominated field when I came into it. But I don't think it's ever intimidated me and I don't think I've ever thought of it like that. I've, uh, you know, I've really enjoyed the process. It's been a very creative process. And I'm going to start by uh, actually taking you back to the genesis of, of the kind of films that I make today. And that genesis, although a lot of it, of course, happened at NID itself, uh, where I did uh, visual communication. But in my fourth uh, year or early in the fifth year, I attended a workshop by a lady called Martha Stewart. And uh, it, was called, uh, it was called Are You Listening? And uh, Martha Stewart ran this organization and she taught filmmaking um, to people, to illiterate people, so that they could tell their own stories. So she had come into India to, um, to work with Seva in Ahmedabad and I had the good fortune of uh, being able to attend the workshop uh, with the Seva people because our professor at NID facilitated it and uh, I was able to work with them and attend the workshop. And uh, what I've put down here is, you know, some of, the, some of the things that the workshop set out to do, which is to say that anybody can tell a story. So, you know, just because we, we came from an institution, and I think the contrast came out even more over there, the fact that these were women, uh, women who were working at Seva were women who were vegetable vendors, who were block printers, who were BD uh, uh, sort of makers, people like that. Uh, she taught them how to make a film so that they could tell their own story. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so for me, it was a huge learning that just because I come from this design institute and from this very elitist background and feel that, you know, okay, this is the only place where you can do films. No, these are people who, without any education, who are completely illiterate, have been taught how to make films and make them effectively. So, like I said, I'm not going to read them out, but basically this is what uh, one learned, or this is what the workshop set out to do. That, you know, that video can be a really powerful communication uh, tool, you know, and that telling a story can be told by anybody and can be done very powerfully, can create a lot of impact. So this is really what they set out to do. These were some of my own learnings from that whole workshop because, um, you know, what, and I have, I'm talking about 40 years ago, so technology was very different, technology was very cumbersome at that point of time, unlike, you know, there were no mobile phones, there was no cameras on mobile phones, so technology was very different, it required a certain amount of learning, but what amazed me again was that these people used things like color coding 
to teach these women because they didn't know how to read a stop or a start or a pause button, but uh, just the red or the blue or the green was sufficient and you realize again the importance of graphic design and you know the importance of each of those colors or symbols in teaching somebody like that um, how to operate uh, you know, a piece of equipment or anything like that. And um, so yes, so that video presents no literacy barriers, that even technology presents no barriers. If you really uh, break beyond those barriers yourself, your own barriers, if you break to say that thing. And you know, the storytelling again, it was very important what I learned in that environment, that telling a story or sharing a story can really be healing and empowering as well because those women, uh, you know, what we talked about in our earlier uh, conversation came from very difficult backgrounds. For them just to be able to tell their stories was healing, you know, to be able to share it in a larger group. Now, all these things are a lot more prevalent now, but again, 40 years ago, it was not something that you did easily, that you didn't come out of your home in the first place as a woman. Seva was mostly women, so it was, you know, for the women to come out of their homes, for them to be able to share their stories, for them to be able to wield the technology and to make films to tell their stories. Those uh, films actually went on then to be used in, in courtrooms. They went on to be used, uh, you know, for larger audiences uh, like, you know, Seva, like NGOs like Seva, again, to sort of, you know, communicate problems, to communicate solutions. So it was really amazing what, uh, what that broke through and what it sort of did. And of course, the organization worked across the world. Seva was just one small pocket out of it. Um, these are just some visuals from them from 40 years ago. This, was, this lady was a vegetable vendor. You know, so for her to be picking up the camera like that, to be sort of doing this thing, that's Ila Ben herself over there. Um, these are again, you know, it used, the camera came with a separate video recorder then. It wasn't like a camcorder like it is now. So it required a separate person to be handling that and be doing the audio, etc. That's me out there on location. So um, these were just, like I said, so this was really the genesis of um, my own filmmaking journey because number one, till then, NID didn't really have uh, filmmaking as a full-fledged course. It was visual communication, filmmaking was a very tiny part of it. But um, this really triggered my interest in, and video had just about come into the country. Uh, the only video that was available was either with Doordarshan or it was available with people who made uh, wedding films. The small VHS cameras, that's all that was available at that point of time. So NID was actually just, uh, we just got all the video equipment. I had the privilege of actually opening up all the equipment and learning how to operate it from manuals, you know, reading up manuals because none of the faculty also was really clued into any, any of the technology because it was new technology world over. So I was really privileged to have got access to it at that point of time. So, um, you know, uh, Number one, my filmmaking journey sort of was triggered from this uh, sort of thing. Number two, uh, you know, filmmaking for the social sector, for the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of impact can be created through storytelling and through films, you know. And I felt that, uh, again, in a position of privilege where I'd had the best education, I should be able to impact a larger group of people and, you know, be able to in, in whatever small way. I mean, I don't say that, you know, one can change the world, but, uh, you know, in whatever small way uh, other than my own environment that I could take those films or reach those films out to a larger audience who might be impacted by it. And uh, so, uh, basically, this again was where my own journey uh, began and when I started making films after I came out of NID, my early years were, I think, focused more on uh, sort of, you know, the craft itself, the technology, the craft of uh, uh, the, the technology, the, you know, how, how to do a good edit, how to do a good frame. So the early years were, I think, more focused on that. One was not focusing so much on the on the kind of films one was doing, one was just, at, at that point of time, you also needed your bread and butter, so you were taking on any kind of work, and yet one was taking on any kind of work with a passion and doing it 
to the best of one's ability, learning how to do it best, learning how to, whether it was a corporate video, whether it was a training video, how well you could do it so that it created a larger impact and sort of reached out to a larger number of people and people looked at it and say. So I sort of, I learned that, you know, you can through a well-told story, you can affect audiences, you can shape attitudes, um, you can build empathy, you can, you can change people's perspectives, you know. I mean, maybe not overnight, but you can, you can at least spark a thought and uh, say that, okay, you can, you can start looking at the sort of problem from a different perspective and saying that, okay, there is a, po a different point of view as well. So there's a lot, and because it's an audio-visual uh, sort of uh, medium, there is a lot of impact that you can sort of uh, create through that. And uh, um, so, I mean, like I said, I started building on my own, um, my own sort of building blocks, so to say, how to make a better film. And I do feel that um, although I've been working completely in the non-fiction space, and by non-fiction, I don't, uh, part of it is documentary, yes, part of it has been corporate videos and the likes of that, but completely in the non-fiction space. And in the non-fiction space, in the documentary space, uh, I've had a lot of people saying to me, I've, I've submitted films which people have come back to say that, but this doesn't look like a documentary. So why should a documentary look like a documentary in the sense that what documentary traditionally used to look at, at least in the older generation, there is a perception of what a documentary should look like, that it shouldn't necessarily be well shot and, you know, nicely framed shots or nice or good editing or good music, you know. So yes, there is that style of documentary uh, filmmaking where you're uh, sort of, you know, eye on the wall and you're doing that kind of this thing where you're not bothering about that. But I have uh, largely focused on films where I've had the opportunity to, to do a good production as well, where I've brought good production values to it as well, apart from the storytelling. And the storytelling, of course, is the crux of it. You know, how to tell that story well has been a very important part of the, of the journey. So what I'm going to do is to just uh, share two, three of my films, which are largely, uh, and I've, I've not done so many documentaries where I have gone out and picked up the subject and done it. It's been largely for clients, yet my selection of those films has been a lot in the social sector because I feel that that's where the impact can be created. So I've worked a lot for organizations like World Bank, UNICEF, uh, Room to Read, Khan Academy, where I've actually gone into deep interiors, shot with people on ground and, uh, you know, Again, like I said, so it's been largely through clients, and yet even those clients, I've had the, you know, again, the good fortune of having people who have let, uh, let the filmmaking be done by us, the creativity be done by us, the storytelling be done by us, largely. You know, you don't always get clients like that who, who leave it to you. They want to sort of determine the way you, uh, or dictate the way that you make a film. So we've been lucky in that uh, uh, sense. So I'm going to sort of uh, show you three films, one after the other, uh, maybe talk a little about each of them uh, in between. The first one is um, for an NGO run by an individual right now who uh, is actually trained at the NBA to be a basketball player, but came back to India and started working with slum children to, uh, to be able to sort of change their lives. Yeah, so this is a film that we did uh, for him to see how it could, again, how they could take this to, you know, and replicate this in other places and see how, because he felt that discipline and, uh, you know, just giving slum children who come from really difficult backgrounds, giving them an outlet uh, can change their lives. And how slowly, slowly he's got into educating them a little, you know, through videos and things like that. And so it's, it's how, you know, their lives have completely changed. So it's a short three, four minute video. Geja in Noida, Uttar Pradesh. Geja Noida is not 
वो मतलब विलेज जैसा एकदम तो यहाँ पे सब लड़कियों को बहुत कम मानते हैं कहते हैं कि सब लड़कियाँ आगे जाके बस रोटी सब्जी बनाएंगी और तो उनको ज्यादा पढ़ाते नहीं है पापा मेरे एक ड्राइवर है और वही पूरे घर का खर्चा चलाते हैं मम्मी जाती है कोठियों में काम करती है कुकिंग और पापा ठीक लगाते हैं सब्जी की मेरे पापा कुछ नहीं करते दारू पीते हैं ड्रिंक करते हैं और मम्मी को कभी कभार बहुत मारते हैं मुझे बहुत रोना आता है बहुत गंदा है गेजा बहुत गंदी तरीके की लैंग्वेज बोलते हैं तो मुझे बिल्कुल अच्छा नहीं लगता पहले लाइफ अच्छी नहीं थी पर अब बहुत कुछ बदल गया है लाइफ चेंज सी हो गई है और ये सब बास्केटबॉल की वजह से हुआ है बास्केटबॉल से मैंने डिसिप्लिन सीखा है अच्छे से रहना अच्छे से बड़ों से बातें करना यहाँ पे आके जिंदगी बन गई मेरी पढ़ाई मिलती है मुझे बॉल मिलती है कोर्ट मिलता है मैं गेजे से बाहर पहले निकला ही नहीं था मैंने बास्केटबॉल की वजह से पूरी दुनिया देखी है जैसे दिल्ली है उसमें एरोप्लेन उड़ते मुझे पता नहीं था पहले मेरी इंग्लिश भी सही नहीं थी मेरे कोई सब्जेक्ट सही नहीं था बास्केटबॉल आने से मेरी इंग्लिश बहुत बेटर हुई है प्रद्युत सर ने स्कॉलरशिप के लिए अप्लाई किया था और आज मैं नोएडा के बेस्ट स्कूल में पढ़ रही हूँ जो कुछ भी मुझे मिला है वो सब प्रद्युत सर की वजह से और बास्कोल की वजह से A lot of them have to play for months with a torn shoe. They probably don't have a pair of shorts or a t-shirt and stuff like that, but nothing stops them from working hard because that's what life is all about. And I'm trying to teach them that no matter what circumstances you are in, nothing can stop you from getting better. Basketball has changed my whole life. Now we can do anything. Sir, it's all for me. My mother, my father, my teacher, my guru, everything is for me. Sir, my life is all for you. Sir, my life is all for you. limited budgets and we can't sort of think but over a period of time i think even ngos have realized that a good film a well made film a good story uh, can completely change the impact and so therefore it's important for them as well to be able to go to the right person to make that film so that when they reach out to whether it's uh, you know for their fundraising whether it's for uh, again you know widening the impact uh, the circle it's if you have a good story uh, in hand it creates an impact and so they have been i think over a period of time everybody has recognized the need for uh, a good film and a good story the way it's told uh, so the next film again is just about a minute and a half it's actually part of a it was a four minute film which we we've sort of done a cut down version for which is for uh, an organization called Khan Academy which does uh, online education for kids and they do free education for kids and this film again was uh, was meant to be for fundraising so that they could you know basically in silicon valley etc they could use it to raise funds and so we basically took uh, three protagonists and through their stories you know how it's been life changing for them this is just one of the three stories because you know i just wanted to sort of give a little sprinkling of the kind of work we do and so this is one of the three stories I belong to a very poor family. At home, just a room. We live there. My father is a car mechanic, and my mother is a housewife. As a child, I used to fear mathematics. Whenever I used to have one question or one doubt, I used to feel very shy asking teachers because I thought that my friends will laugh at me and stuff. But 
then Khan Academy's videos are best because I can play it whenever I want, how many times I want it. So because of videos, my concepts were crystal clear. Now I am able to teach my fellow students. I am in love with mathematics just because of Khan Academy. And of course Khan Academy is best because it is free of cost. I also want to prove the world and of course my village that having a girl child is not a problem. Basically I want to change the world and education is the best way to do it. So I started with myself, then of course to my village and then the whole world. None of these are scripted per se. These are all told in their own words. So I mean, you know, her wanting to change the world is the way she thinks, not the way I think, you know. So, and I think that uh, that's again something that we've been able to do over a period of time where we've been able to, you know, one, uh, as a filmmaker, one is able to establish a connect with the protagonist. I mean, that also takes, uh, you know, a little bit of learning and skill to do, to be able to establish that trust, to be able to have the protagonist trust you, to be able to share some of the things, you know, it's not easy to... Uh, be on camera or to be in front of a camera, it's not easy at all, you know, and to especially to share your sort of inner thoughts. So that also is a skill that one sort of learns over a period of time. Uh, this right here is a film we've done quite recently. These, these are scripted films. These were six films that we did for UNICEF. There was June was um, mental health for adolescents month. It was parenting month as well. And so they wanted to do sort of six different films which um, help, which were sort of targeted at parents as well as children, um, you know, and what to do with mental health. So this is just one of the six films, but uh, I just wanted to share it with you. Yeah, but. Acha, Dad. Huh? 12th ki farewell, agle Sunday. Very wonderful. आपको पता है वो कुनाल मेरा क्लासमेट हाँ वो आजकल बहुत स्ट्रेस्ड आउट है किसी से बात बात नहीं करता है बहुत बहुत अकेला सा हो गया है प्रॉब्लम क्या है हीज हीज डिफरेंट वो कह रहा था कि फेयरवेल में कुछ अलग सा पहनना चाहता है कुछ रंग बिरंगा सा विद असेसरीज डिफरेंट मतलब साड़ी पहनेगा क्या उसमें क्या प्रॉब्लम है सीरियसली मुझे लगा तू मजाक कर रहा था यार उसके पेरेंट्स कंजर्वेटिव हैं खरबर से निकाल दिया तो घर से क्यों निकालेंगे उसकी चॉइस है ना डैड अपने भाई और मुझे ये तो सिखाया है उसकी आइडेंटिटी है उसकी पहचान है तो उसे अपनाने की भी तो आजादी होनी चाहिए ना लेकिन अपने पेरेंट्स से शेयर करने की उसकी हिम्मत नहीं हो रही सोच सोच के परेशान हो रहा है वैसे बात तो उसे करनी चाहिए अपने पेरेंट्स से लेकिन मुझे पता नहीं कि ऐसी चीज उसके पेरेंट्स एक्सेप्ट कर पाएंगे या नहीं और डैड मेरे पेरेंट्स क्या आप लोग एक्सेप्ट कर पाओगे You know, dealing with a different aspect of uh, mental health for kids and you know this came also under one of them how much mental stress a child undergoes if he or she is not able to express their own identity in a safe space so that's what it really was about um, so I'm sort of moving on to 
uh, the next level and where my learning sort of came a full circle, uh, you know, very recently, where my own learnings uh, far back from the Martha Stewart Are You Listening workshop have come a full circle very recently. And a lot of it is because of the new technology that's available, the fact that uh, you know, smartphones are available in everybody's hands now and uh, smartphones are so sort of user-friendly and uh, intuitive in the way that they can be used that everybody feels that they can uh, make a film. So I'm again relating it to filmmaking. Everybody and anybody has the confidence enough because they have, uh, you know, the technology is so easy now. Um, yet, of course, the storytelling still remains an art. I do feel that the storytelling remains an art. But, uh, you know, the, the, the technological capabilities have, so to say, you know, broken geographical barriers because, I mean, again, social media, the kind of reach that you get, the kind of penetration that you get with the kind of films that are uh, being made is completely a different level altogether, you know. And, uh, and yet it becomes that much more challenging because the remote is in the person's hand, you know, in the viewer's hand, and you can switch very easily or you can just, you know, very easily turn away from what is being produced, so it becomes that much more important to penetrate, to tell a story well, to sort of, you know, break through the clutter and to be able to do the storytelling well. So therefore, I'm coming to what my basic subject was, which is the democratization of storytelling, which is what the Are You Listening workshop, I think, first told me to begin with, or first taught me to begin with, that it's, it's a very democratic sort of this thing. It's just, just because I'm educated doesn't mean that I can tell the story or that I know the technology to tell the story. Anybody can do it and do it well. Um, and so, you know, the power of the story uh, becomes that much more important in today's day and age because visual stories can they can act, you know spark activity so quickly you know I mean one has seen it uh, ourselves very recently whether it's been uh, the Black Lives Matter whether it's been the Me Too movements how quickly they have moved because of the power of the visual because you see the other person who's being impacted by it you're not just hearing about it you're seeing the person you're seeing the visuals playing from across the world of people being impacted by it and so it spreads like wildfire because of that and of course therefore also a sense of responsibility in what you do because it that, that's the flip side of social media the fact that it spreads like fire and so one has to use it uh, responsibly and uh, yet like I said the new technologies are uh, sort of enabling audiences and they are enabling them to you're sort of co-creating across geographies because you're getting contributions from across the world you're being able to sort of you know uh, share things share stories and uh, they they sort of allow you to leverage local realities they uh, allow you to sort of share conventional wisdom which a lot of us may not have access to under normal circumstances and so therefore they are uh, profoundly democratic and why i'm sort of bringing this into current day uh, sort of context is that very recently about 6 months ago we were approached by uh, youtube uh, by the channel itself and uh, they have what they call creators so anybody who's uh, you know regularly uh, doing content for YouTube is a YouTube creator and uh, this was a global campaign that uh, YouTube had started called creator spotlight where they were spotlighting their creators but typically across the world what they did was they were picking up people who had the maximum number of subscribers which were typically celebrities already and they were showcasing, they were telling the stories of those celebrities. In India, what the organization chose to do is to go to the grassroots. And uh, they approached us to do films, uh, profiles of uh, eight different people who they had identified from the grassroots. These are all people now who had 3.5, uh, 4 billion subscribers already, you know. Uh, but there were people, one was a farmer, one was a third generation farmer who was sort of, you know, trying to revive farming because his father had gone out of farming because, you know, it wasn't lucrative enough. Uh, one was a guy from Kerala who uh, had, you know, who, who was actually, he, he, doesn't even, he doesn't speak English or Hindi, speaks only Malayalam, still has 3.5 million subscribers, who does DIY science videos for kids. 
So, you know, little uh, sort of solar run boat, a little jet ski, you know, things like that, which really excite children. And he's got a huge audience because of that. There's a young lady from a village who, who runs a Rangoli channel. You know, she's got, again, 2.5 million subscribers just doing Rangoli every morning. And so, I mean, I won't talk about all of them. I'm just going to show you a little video, which is actually uh, a montage of all the stories, because they're were, they were actually 15-minute videos on each of them, which profile each of them. But uh, for me, it came a full circle, you know. Uh, the learning came a full circle, because here were people who were completely from the grassroots, who had no tr training in how to make a film, who were creating videos and had garnered this many number of subscribers more than you know maybe any of us could do, uh, just because of the content that they were creating. So the power of the content that they were creating, the story that were telling, they were telling was so large that uh, they were able to reach that kind of an audience. And that really was, I mean, it really opened my eyes. It inspired me so much that these are people living in villages, you know, and these are people who have such big ideas because there's one guy who runs something called My Village Show who does, uh, who does these, you know, films and videos um, on, on local issues, on social local issues. So, you know, whether it's uh, alcoholism or uh, whether it's drugs or that kind of thing that their village faces. Uh, he makes these videos and he uses characters and actors from within his community. So they've all become little heroes and heroines in their own spaces because they've all acted. He, he scripts them, they're all because he found that, you know, he uh, makes more impact by making interesting sort of uh, satirical kind of films rather than just uh, sort of dry docu kind of thing. So, uh, so his entire village has sort of become his cast. Uh, so much so that there is like there was one lady who's acted in uh, one of his not one but in multiple of his videos who was actually she used to work uh, she was a laborer on construction sites, but today she's been uh, taken on to Big Boss, you know, because she's become such a star in his videos. So it's amazing the kind of change that these people have been able to create in their own environment through the story telling and through filmmaking and which is really what the power of the medium is which is what you know I wanted to talk about so I'm just going to play this it's like I said it's a montage of their stories <laughs> Hi friends! Namaskar me Madhura. Swagat hai aapka Indian farmer me. Welcome back to my village show. What up bro? What's up? Hi Adam, welcome to my new vlog. Namaste, I'm Sunita from Easy Rongal. Ready? Kick it up and start. Just like that, my father got me. मैं छोटी उम्र से ही like मुझे कमाना है, अपने family के लिए कुछ करना है ये आ गया था दिमाग में. ये चीज़ जागा देखते हैं, दोन पिलर्चा में थे. गाँव देहात में कैसे होता है कि इंजीनियर बनूंगा डॉक्टर बनूंगा भले वो कुछ ना करे अगर कहेगा बंदा कि खेती करना चाहता हूँ तो ट्रस्ट नहीं करेंगे कहेंगे क्या है ये क्या पढ़ना है इसमें मन जैसे प्रति वीडियो लोग माइविले शो वीडियो लोग कंप्लीट को मैसेज देते इंटरनल वन पर बट कुछ जब सेटेरिकल वेलो को फन वेलो चुपिस्ता वन पर न्याय विश्वसी के लोगों को टीकले इंगे ने चिंदी के नाम इंदर ने पढ़ी पिके इंदर अलर्ट की हो तुम नहीं कर सकते ऐसा कुछ भी नहीं है पैसे की जरूरत नहीं है एक जज्बे की जुनून की और कर दिखाने की एक जरूरत होती है I wanted like that hundred k views in my videos once and the first one got like three million which got like viral after that point of time like you know it's never about numbers for me I'm that guy who enjoys the process more than the outcome it's it's just about finding that one thing that you love and keep doing it over and over again What I wanted to talk about as far as, uh, you know, my work in the social sector is concerned, I just wanted to share one more video with you that uh, is actually to do with climate change. So apart from uh, the work that we do in the social sector, there's a lot of work that I do for Discovery, for uh, History Channel, for channels like that, where we do a lot of one-hour specials for them on various subjects. I've been asked very often what I specialize in. I don't think I specialize in any one particular subject. I specialize in storytelling, and so therefore, the story can be about anything and everything, you know. And the subjects have been very varied. I've done uh, 
I've done films on a moon mission. I've done films on uh, the Ramayan. This film is about climate change. So it's been very, very varied uh, subject. And like I said, uh, it's the storytelling and of course th the filmmaking itself. The uh, you know the sort of the nitty gritty of filmmaking itself that one has enjoyed putting together and uh, you know put all our films together with that. So this is just something we'd done I think three four years ago for Discovery, which is on climate change. In August 2019, just in 12 days, India has got a thousand extreme and heavy rainfall events. A government agency recently said that Delhi is going to run out of water within the next 18 months. Can you imagine the catastrophe of that? Dozen Indian cities are facing this absolutely existential crisis of water. The concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are the highest ever in the last 800,000 years. In fact, it would put a big question mark uh, on the survivability of the human civilization. The impact of the vehicular pollution means that children are actually not uh, making brain cells and that is also accounting for the increased amount of autism and attention deficit. In about a matter of seconds, water started to enter the house from the roads, bathrooms, kitchen. People like us are protected. We believe and it's our arrogance which has created the problem because we believe nothing can affect us. It is happening. It is here and now. It is affecting us. We are simply not connecting the dots. We will have less water. We will have less food. Our economy will shrink. Climate change could be the biggest reason for conflict uh, in the future. It will be a major civil strife that nations cannot handle. We don't have time anymore. Yeah, we did, we did, we took a very alarmist approach for this very intentionally, so it was a very deliberate decision with the channel that we wanted to go alarmist so that we shake up everybody and talk about climate change. So again, you know, uh, in terms of storytelling, that's the positioning that one took, one took a very, like I said, a conscious and deliberate effort to do that. Um, so that brings me to the end of my sort of presentation and happy to have any questions do I have an audience in mind? Yes, absolutely. I think that's the that's the start of our uh, of any film where one uh, makes the effort. You know, as far as the brief from the client is concerned, it's a, it's a very important part of our decision making that what the audience is and who it has to reach out to, because it definitely changes the way you tell the story. You know, how you would tell the story to a particular type of audience as compared to a different type of audience. So yes, it plays a very important part in our decision making and how to tell the story. How do you assess the transformative impact? It's very hard to assess the transformation impact uh, before you make the film. But we generally try and do so after we've made the film as far as possible, reach back, whether, you know, if it's for a client, reach back to the client to find out what the numbers were, how it impact, uh, impacted, you know, how far it uh, reached. Uh, it was very sort of, you know, many years ago we did a film, uh, again, I'm talking about almost 25 years ago, we did a film for uh, UNICEF where uh, they were training village hand pump mechanics, you know, and we went very far into Jharkhand, into the tribal belt where they had trained their first two mechanics, you know. And we did a film on them. And some 15 years later, I had gone to a UNICEF event and I was told that, you know, we are still using that film because that particular film was so inspirational that we are still using it to go to villages and 
you know, tell them ki we hand pump mechanics bano, you know, telling women that. So it's very gratifying when you get that kind of thing. And like I said, we do make the effort to go back to a client generally. Don't just forget that we made the film and walk out of it. But we do try and go back to find out that where it failed or where it worked. What I'm asking you is, you trained as a graphic designer. Uh, there was no film education that time. I'm, I'm sure that one uh, workshop exposure is what changed your life, right? and made you the filmmaker. So how do you compare yourself with, with people who trained as filmmakers during that time? Because FTI existed, a lot of other, uh, few other uh, film uh, places existed. Why I'm asking you this question is because during one of my trips to Mumbai, during the same time uh, when we were at NID, um, I met Sham Benigal, and I didn't know what to talk to him, so I just told him I'm very interested in films. And he's saying, no, you're not. So I asked him why. He's saying if you were interested in films, you would go to FTI. You will not go to NID. And and very frankly, that's that's one uh, time I started thinking of myself as a very different, not as a filmmaker. Not so. When is it this transition happened to you, and how do you see it? Uh, like that's probably one or two workshops which made that pivot, right? Yes, absolutely, Sudhir. Because like I said. Um, I mean, when we went into NID, yes, I trained in visual communication and largely in graphic design. My interest lay a lot in photography, actually. So, I mean, that was really the genesis of it. But, uh, so I hadn't gone in there with the idea of becoming a filmmaker. No, not at all. But the workshop definitely triggered that in uh, my mind. And I came out of there thinking, and I did my final diploma project. My other area of passion was education. You know, so my final diploma project was actually combined the two passions. So I did audiovisual aids for for the classroom. At that point of time, no audiovisual aids existed. You only had the textbook. So I actually went out. I got three schools to sponsor me. Uh, so they actually paid for me to go out and make films. And NID was, I would say, good enough to give me a full uh, sort of access to equipment which had just come in. Like I said, we actually opened the equipment. I took it out of the cartons. I learned how to operate it, um, you know, through manuals because nobody there, there was only uh, our sound person and Mr. Mathur, neither of them knew how to operate any of the equipment. So I actually self-taught all the, um, you know, the technology. And I think that's the other thing that as far as I'm concerned, personally, I was not intimidated by the technology. I came back and then again, we opened all the edit equipment and we actually learned the whole edit process as well, you know. So I was not intimidated by technology. So I adapted very quickly to it. And I think what my NID training and my graphic design training taught me was that um, visually I'm able to sort of, you know, uh, I think that bring a lot of value to the film visually, whether it's the framing, whether it's also the graphic design, because every film, maybe not so much these films, but a lot of the films we do have a lot of graphic design in it. There's a lot of motion graphics in it, you know? And so therefore, there is a lot of that training that comes very subconsciously. It's been sort of ingrained, I think, in on our, all our DNAs. And it's very much there. So I've been, you know, I would say that I've put every bit of my training at NID to use. And yes, I didn't go to FTI, but I don't think that today I'm any sort of, you know, uh, in any way lacking from what, because again, at FTI, I think it's the training of the, it's more the skills that they teach you. The rest of it comes yourself by learning yourself, by being out there in the field. It's your basic skills that you would learn over there, right? So I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Hi, Sujata. Uh, Hi. Can you? Yeah. Yes. So um, you clearly have um, a lot of access now to data about how people consume their media, right, compared to what you had 30 years ago. And do you find that, like he mentioned, the shortening of attention spans, do you find that knowing people's consumption patterns has affected how you go about your storytelling to tailor it more specific? Like you said, you don't know what will make something viral but I can certainly give you some objective criteria that will make sure it never becomes viral, right? Like a 60 second intro of uh, nothing. So for example, when you're making this uh, trailer on global warming or climate change, have you chosen to make it so alarmist because that is the stand you want to take to draw in more users, more viewers, or is that the stand you want to take to impact the already existing viewers that you know will watch it? Like what's the goal with 
No, it's definitely a combination of all of that because definitely, you know, uh, like Jatin asked that, you know, do you know your target audience and is, does that play? So, I mean, this comes pretty much as part of that, you know, your target audience and how they consume that video is something that you have to address when you're designing your video or you're sort of planning your film. Um, that how do you draw them in in that first one minute or that first two minutes so that they don't yeah, switch channels. So it's definitely a part of, I, I can't say that one can ignore uh, the consumption patterns, et cetera, and that, that's, that's definitely how you would, how every video changes, how your, uh, how, how the way you tell the story changes depending on how you want to reach out to the audience. So yes, going the alarmist route was, was a combination of the two. Uh, number one, because you wanted people to sit up and uh, watch it, and number two, you know, they, you wanted them to notice the fact that, uh, yeah, this is what we are talking, this is the subject that we are talking about and that it's important in our lives. So it is a combination of both things.